how to build a universe in a computer and not just any computer, a supercomputer. What's the Jaws phrase, we're going to need a bigger boat or we're going to need a bigger computer? We always need a bigger computer. I've built universes in various computers. We have a supercomputer-ish here that I think it has about 5,000 processors or something, which you can do some universes in. But if you want to go for the really big ones, I used a big one in Switzerland with 128,000 processors. So you log into it across the internet and uh, put your thing in. So the first thing I did was type in you know, how much free space have I got and it came up with 1.6 petabytes. So I had to look up exactly what a petabyte was because I thought I knew but petabytes is a thousand terabytes. There was a huge amount of space available but it's frightening how quickly you can get through that space. <laughs> Firstly you have to have something that is suitable for a supercomputer so it, it has lots and lots of processors. So you have to have a job that can be divided up into little bits. And uh, it also has to scale reasonably well. So if you double the number of processors, does it halve the amount of time or does it just bring it down a little bit? And so if you go to 100,000 CPUs, does it make it 100,000 times quicker or does it just make it 20 times quicker? That sort of thing you need to know before you start. And then once you've done that, then you have to set up the uh, the whole environment. So it's a batch environment. You submit your job, say this is what I want to run. I want to run it on this many processors. I want this amount of memory available. I want to, I'm going to write this many files. And that goes off and disappears into the sort of ether. And then at some point the batch system will come around and say, right, I've got enough spare room to run your job and off it will go. Which is usually sort of late Sunday night or something like that. So uh, you, you can arrange for an email to come. And so an email will pop up and say, your job has started. And it's very often followed by another one saying, your job has finished in a, in a, or aborted uh, because you've made some error that uh, you, you were not quite right. So you normally start with a, a small subset of CPUs and make sure that everything is going to work and just run it for half an hour or something like that. And then you go, bigger and bigger until you're confident that it will run across the whole time. When you're working out whether you can parallelize this, it's like a, a person digging a hole with a spade. If you give them a hundred spades, they can still only dig at the same speed. Right? Absolutely, yeah. But then if you give a hundred people one spade, they still can only dig at the same <laughs> speed. You need that magic hundred people with a hundred spades, right? Yeah, and you also, even if you've got a hundred people with a hundred spades, they can't necessarily all get to the, the hole. There's always going to be some restriction that's going to slow you down. So. You know, it's 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 trade-offs for those things. How do you get around those restrictions? What's the what's the way of organising it? Uh, you just have to sort of divide it up. So in, in the case of this, we're building a universe. So we build up little sort of quadrants or or, or tiny bits of the universe, and uh, a small group of processors will work on that, and another group will work on a bit of it over here. But eventually, they do need to communicate because stuff grows up here, and the gravity affects the stuff over here. So they all have to communicate. But you can go for a little while with sort of ignoring the outside, or, or just working with the previous version of the outside world, and then you have to chat amongst yourselves and say, "Well, this is the new state of it," and then you can run for a bit further. So it sort of goes in those lock steps every so often. Um, also because your programs are not necessarily bug free, uh, you save the state of the universe. So you, you run for a, you know, half a billion years or something of uh, uh, effectively um, universe time and then you save absolutely everything you can uh, so that, um, well, you know, if every, everything collapses, you've at least got that. But you can also um, tell the program to start from that, uh, what we call, a, call it a snapshot of the data. So you can start from there and then run from there so if, if it all does fall over but you've you've got a few billion years into it you can at least start from that point and uh, carry on i think the clickbait title for this has got to be how many times you save the universe <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great clickbait yes yeah yeah so having saved the universe how much data are we talking here for a universe save <laughs> well it depends uh, exactly how big or how fine grained you're going to uh, make it but you know, a typical simulation is probably a billion particles we use to simulate a universe. Each one of those has an x, y, and z coordinate. It has a velocity, so vx, vy, vz. Sometimes we keep mass, or sometimes we just have all the particles with the same mass. Uh, sometimes we have other bits and pieces of information that we can work out at the time that are worth saving. But it's fairly large. Um, 
you know, it's in the sort of terabyte range uh, for each of these snapshots. And we might save uh, five or six hundred of these over a run so that once we've completed it and we found something interesting, uh, you know, in today's universe, we can actually track that back through the, the snapshot and say, well, how did that feature arise? You know, if we wander back, we can see its history. So you want all that data saved. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty big. So, as I said, you know, 1.6 uh, petabytes, but uh, you, you're going through you know, two or three terabytes each snapshot you uh, save. I'm just now thinking that those petabytes are not very close to us here. What's the process of getting the data from the supercomputer to you? Well, it's, it's over the internet and it's typically frantic. <laughs> so another problem you have with the supercomputer is you only have it for a certain amount of time. So you have allocated research time and, you know, I was finished on, I think, you know, March the 31st. So sort of the beginning of March, you start to think about getting that data off there. And uh, even with the fastest uh, internet connections, it takes a long while to transfer you know, many terabytes of information. And you've also got to work out where you're going to store it because you can't, you know, <laughs> we haven't got terabytes of uh, spare space just hanging around. So I, I do remember walking around Asda, uh, looking at these stacks of DVD ROMs that you could buy and thinking, I wonder how many of those I need to put in my shopping cart to actually store all this turned out to be far too many, so uh, we didn't go with that. Um, so eventually we did find somewhere more locally that we could store it. So you want to store it, and then you can process it and start to analyse it and uh, look, look for patterns in it. But it's something you need to think of, not at the last minute, because it takes typically weeks to transfer this amount of data. And that analysis, the analysis doesn't happen on the supercomputer, or is it just that you might use it and load it in somewhere and you, you can do it on the supercomputer sometimes we have done it there but um, you, you as well as having a time budget you have a cpu budget so you have so many million hours or something of cpu time so you could use it for running the simulation and you could use it for analyzing it uh, or you might want to spend all your time running the simulation to uh, its sort of nth degree and then do the analysis somewhere else Somewhere else has to be quite big to read in these large amounts of data and process it, but it's, it's more tractable, so we could run that on our Nottingham supercomputer rather than... But then you've got to transfer the data, you know, a chunk at a time over to that computer and let it run and process it. This is the old argument about a truck full of hard disks, isn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, well, could I just fly over to Switzerland and pick up the data in a couple of large suitcases? Might that be quicker? But uh, anyway, it wasn't. <laughs> Ask them to print it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Punch cards, that's the way. It's the future. If we just scroll forward in time, we can see that as things start to happen, we get to this point where everything starts to reroute. And rather than going directly to Facebook, you can start to see it. W, this is some actual ciphertext that we'll be breaking later. Does it honestly start with Zeus, as in Conrad's Zeus? Yes. In the reality of random, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah.